are listening to season four of the Devoted Dreamers podcast. Welcome everyone. I'm your host, Merit Ansa, and this show exists to help you step over whatever is holding you back from all that God created you for. You know, the more I talk to women about their dreams, the more I hear the echoes of fear, imposter syndrome, of who am I to do this, or somebody else is already doing it or could do it better than me. I recognize those voices because I've wrestled with them too. But I'm here to tell you that you cannot let the voices win because you are a daughter of the King. God created you with a purpose, one that's unique to you. And he put those dreams in your heart for a reason. Sure, it's scary. Yeah, you might even fail, but you also might learn something and then pick yourself up and lock arms with your community and keep taking the next step. That's why we're here, and it's what this podcast is all about. And I pray today's episode will provide exactly what you need to keep moving forward toward the dream God has put on your heart. You'll always find the show notes for each episode on my website at meritonsa.com slash podcast. And there will be more later in the show about how to connect with me and the Devoted Dreamers tribe. But now, here's today's episode. Hello, Devoted Dreamers. You are listening to episode 93. And this um, conversation today is with Crystal Woodman Miller. I'm excited to let you get to know her a little bit and hear her story, but here are a few little details. Um, she lives in Morrison, Colorado, so not too far down the road from me. Um, she has a sweet husband, Pete, and three little ones, um, Luca, Malachi, and Josephine, all under seven. And she's the author of Marked for Life, Choosing Hope and Discovering Purpose After Earth-Shattering Tragedy. And the tragedy you all have probably at least um, heard of or are slightly familiar with. It's the shooting at Columbine High School in 1999. And um, she is a speaker on issues of faith and hope in the midst of suffering as a result of that part of her story. So I'm really excited to have Crystal here with us today. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you, Merit, for having me. So... Why don't you tell us, um, you know, I of course want to talk about your God-shaped dream, but we can't really go far into that without talking about Columbine. So can you start us off sharing a bit of your story there? Yeah, you bet. Um, I was 16 years old at the time. I was a junior in high school, and I was a I was your pretty typical teenager. Um, cared mostly about clothes and and friends and boys and and maybe a little bit about school, <laughs> but <laughs> rarely thought much beyond high school. Um, but of course, in April of 1999, which was just over 19 years ago, um, everything would change. I mean, I think I was forced to grow up really quickly and, and really forced to just kind of recognize the world for what it was, sadly. And, um, and, and so, yeah, so on that particular day, on, on April 20th, 1999, I had decided to go to the library with a couple of my friends. And it was during my lunch hour. And, and, and most days, my friends and I could leave campus and kind of come and go from the school. But we had gone to the library because I had to study for a test. And so the, the three of us had gone into the library and had been in there maybe five minutes when there was chaos that erupted in our school. And a teacher came running in screaming that there was guys with guns and bombs that we needed to hide under our tables. And so the three of us did that immediately didn't really understand what was happening. We hadn't really heard much about school violence up until that time. And so we thought it was a joke or a prank of some sort. And, um, and, and, and we quickly learned that it was not that, that this was in fact something very serious. And my friend Seth, he turned to both Sarah and I, um, and he said, you guys need to start praying. I have no idea what's going to happen, but God is the only one who can get us out of here. Mm -hmm. And, um, I remember just praying that that it would all be over quickly and that, that God would 
you know, send the police and send people to help us. And then about that time, I heard gunfire and those loud noises coming closer. And my friend Seth kind of laid down next to me and he wrapped his arms around me. And he said, Crystal, I promise that I will take a bullet for you. And that's actually when my prayer got very serious. Okay, God, if you are real, if you are the God that people have, have told me about, then get me out of here alive. I'll quit the parting and all the bad things that I was doing, you know, as a high school student. I said, God, I will give you my life forever. And with that, the two boys entered into the library and the, the um, gunfire and the killing, it lasted seven and a half minutes. Mm. And those seven and a half minutes felt like an eternity as I was literally waiting to die, wondering what it would feel like when I got shot, if I would die quickly or if I would suffer slowly. As we listened to those two gunmen weave in and out of tables, ending lives, mocking, making fun of their victims based on the way that they looked, the color of their skin, if they were overweight. They were asking people if they believed in God. And the whole time, just my whole body was shaking so uncontrollably from the fear and um, just the, the un, just unknowing what was about to happen. And after, after about seven minutes, the two boys had come up the middle section and they were pushing in chairs to get through. And the middle section was where myself and my friends were hiding. They had already shot and killed everybody, almost everybody in the library at that point. And they turned to the, to the table right next to us. We could hear them right there. They were laughing and making fun of this, this, this young man. And they shot and they killed him. And then they turned to our table and they pushed a chair in underneath of the table. And I was laying right on the side where they were standing. And they started using our table almost um, to kind of collect inventory of what they had left of their weapons and their bullets and realized that they needed to go and reload. Um, and so at that moment, they left the library, but they made it abundantly clear that they were going to come back to kill the rest of us. And so at that moment, the shooting had stopped um, and it gave myself and my two friends the opportunity to get up and to escape, which we did so immediately, um, literally having to step over the bodies of friends and classmates so that we could get out of uh, out alive. And what we learned later is that the library was the scene of the most intense violence, um, that there were 10 of the 13 killed inside of the library and 15 of the 24 wounded. And, and we learned, too, that our table was one of the only tables that was not hit, that didn't have someone that was killed or injured. So it was a it, it was obviously um, life changing in every way, and the aftermath it was some of the hardest, most dark days of my life. You know that I was I was I was so overcome and so overwhelmed with the pain and the fear that some days I wished that I had died in that library. I had no idea at age sixteen how I was going to walk through this. We had no roadmap mm -hmm. for suffering on this level, but let alone in the national spotlight, you know, something so massive and so big. And um, it was just, it was a day by day by day journey. And so I started crying out to God for God was the only one that I, that, that I knew to turn to in that moment, everything else, like it, it felt like it had fallen apart and it felt as though God was all that was left. And I would cry out to him, God, I can't make it through this second, through this minute, through this hour, through this morning, through this day, through this week, through this month, through this year without you. And I felt like gently, he just continued to remind me, you know, like he did in, with Paul in Second Corinthians, Crystal. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. I am most strong when you are weak. And I felt like he just, this verse and, and so many like this gave me the courage to continue to getting, to get up out of bed and to continue to put one foot in front of the other and to continue to live. And he truly, and I don't want to make it sound like it just happened overnight. It was a journey, but God was so faithful and he was so near to me in those dark and difficult moments that I knew that I was not going through the suffering alone, but rather with him. And that as a result, I was, I was falling deeper in love with him. 
I was starting to understand his love and, and his character more. And I recognize, you know, even it talks about in Isaiah, it says, though the mountains may shake and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace removed from you, says the Lord who has compassion on you. And that's exactly, he was my peace. He was my anchor in the middle of the storm, firm and secure. You know, he was all of those things because I just had to cling on to him desperately, the hope giver himself. And I watched him do really un, un, unexplainable things that can't be done apart from Jesus. Wow. I mean, what a story that is. And I can only imagine um, like the, just how life changing it was, as you said. And I wanted to ask like where, how would you describe where your faith was the day before Columbine happened? You know, that's a great question because um, on April, you know, 19th, 1999, I was going to church. Um, I had started going back to church. Um, I guess I should back up. I kind of, um, I had started going to church simply because my grandma, she, um, I didn't grow up in a, in a church family, um, but my grandma started coming. She would drive from downtown out to where I lived in the suburbs and she would take me to church. And so I kind of grew up doing that since junior high and I'd given my life to the Lord, but come high school years, I just started partying, making a lot of really poor choices. And I kind of fell away from the Lord, but just a few months before the shootings at Columbine, I had started going back to church. But in all honesty, I was, I was really lukewarm. I was kind of still half in the world. I, there was this pull and this tension where I still wanted to party and be with my friends from high school. And there was this other part of me that just yearned to be back at church and, and making good choices and back where people accepted me for who I was. And I wasn't trying to be somebody that I wasn't. Mm -hmm. So, right before the shootings, I was kind of, I was trying to figure it out. You know, I, I was still kind of walking the line a little bit. And um, obviously Columbine underneath of that table, it changed everything. And I would never, ever go back. And for that, I'm very grateful that it has forever changed the trajectory of my life. So all of that put together, how would you describe then um, the dream that God's put in your heart? Or it's one of the other ways I say it is what, um, what you think God created you for. That is a great, I love how you put that too. You know, because even after the shootings, I, I was started, I started to get opportunities to, to travel and speak. I was invited by churches or communities to come out and to share my story. And I was never, I mean, even in high school, uh, you couldn't pay me enough to stand up and give a speech in class. Mm -hmm. So becoming a speaker was never on my radar. I thought I was going to be a school teacher or do, do something else. But honestly, um, I think what was placed in me is this, this, desire and this dream to teach people. And I thought that it had to look like teaching students or, or kids, but really what started to take shape was that dream just in a different way. It just looked different. And that's what I tell people so often is that I'm still teaching. It just looks a little bit different. You know, my, my audiences change and, and um, I get to travel and get to do all of these things. And so this, this, this absolutely, I just feel like I come alive when I get to speak and I get to share my story and I get to share the word of God because I believe that as we share our stories and as we share um, God's word, that he uses those things to make an impact for his kingdom. And and my heart is really just to, to point back to him. You know, if he can use my story, if he can take all of the brokenness and all of the ashes and bring about something beautiful if he can take the pain and he can bring about something purposeful, but for his glory, then that's truly what I want. And so over time, I started to really love 
speaking more than I ever imagined I would. And, and, and so and part of it too was I loved traveling and meeting people and I loved traveling the world because I would get to experience other cultures and, and I had this heart for just living overseas and for helping uh, the widows and the orphans and helping those who were living in poverty and sickness. And I think that by doing so, I really saw healing take place in my own heart because I'm a firm believer that when we take our eyes off of our own situation and we focus on others, that healing takes place in our own lives. And I remember the first time that I traveled after the shootings at Columbine, I was invited to go to Kosovo with Operation Christmas Child, Samaritan's Purse, mm -hmm. and um, invited by Franklin Graham and, and their whole whole company there. And, and I went to Kosovo, and Kosovo itself was so devastated by the war that had taken place there. And Kosovo, to me, felt like the library on a grand scale. I mean, everything was devastated and pockmarks from bullets and, and massive holes from bombs and people just wore on their faces the, the despair and the difficulty and the hopelessness. And so when I was able to go there, I saw something happen in me, the shift take place where I realized what I went through lasted seven and a half minutes under that table in the library at Columbine High School. But there are people in this world who are literally living their Columbine experience or their suffering 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's this is suffering that won't end. And so I wanted to be about helping others, not because I felt like I had something that they needed, but I just feel like if we can walk with others in their pain and their difficulties, I feel like that's where things can start to happen. That's where life takes place. If we just sit and listen or we, or we, you know, link our arms with somebody else and say, you're not doing this alone. I think that's one way we can love people and people see Jesus. Mm. So for the last how 19 years, you've been going out into the world and sharing hope in the midst of suffering. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I can't even begin to tell you how, how thankful I am for that, that I have been invited into people's suffering, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, I know that that almost maybe sounds crazy to some people, but I consider it such a sacred space and such an honor to, to go and serve in Indonesia after the tsunami or to go to Beslan, Russia after a terrorist attack and help there or to go, you know, to Africa and live in Africa and help people who don't have clean water and homes to live in and to teach them, you know, about about, about God's word, you know, but also I've been invited in to come into um, cities and places who've also experienced similar violence as we did at Columbine. Um, I've been to Virginia Tech after the shootings happened there. Um, I went to Newtown, Connecticut um, and, and got to be with kids and families in that community after that horrific event. And even just recently, I was in Parkland, Florida. I was there four days after the shootings took place. And I was invited by a group of churches and they had me come in and speak. And I interacted with so many students who had just experienced their life altering um, tragedy, you know, and I really, I even stood up speaking to a group of kids who had just come over from a, from their coach's funeral. And I stood up and I said, listen, I am standing here as living proof that this shooting, that this event, that it does not have to be your end, but rather your beginning. And it starts with how you will choose to respond to this thing that has happened to you. And so I think that just being able to be there and show them that there is hope, there's something really powerful and tangible in that. Oh my goodness, absolutely. And the reality is that, um, you know, you don't have to experience that kind of violence or, and that kind of suffering to kind of have a hard time in this life. Like 
there are lots of really hard things that happen to people. And so I feel like your message relates to anybody, whether they've been a part of a violent act or not. Well, and that's my heart is that it would, it, that anybody can relate with this, mm-hmm. with this um, message of hope. And that's what I tell people. I say, it does not matter what you have been through. Your story, your pain is your story and your story matters. And you're exactly right, Merritt, that it doesn't have to look like a violent event at your school or a church or a theater, but it can simply look like divorce. It can look like addiction. It can look like the death, loss of a dream. It can look like fear or infertility or poverty or um, prodigal children. Or, I mean, there's so many things that we walk through that are so incredibly painful and no no one's suffering is any greater or less. Our suffering deeply matters to the heart of God. And, and I think that's the important message is that God loves us so much that he sent his own son to suffer immense pain in order that we may experience joy and life and even assurance of his glory, that he is still good and that he can never be anything other than good. Mm-hmm. Amen. Well, I would love to have you talk a little bit about, um, I mean, obviously you kind of started down this road pretty young, um, but can you talk about the, any of the struggles or challenges, like really the internal stuff that you've had to battle in walking forward with this dream? Yeah, you know, I, um, you're exactly right when you call it an internal struggle, because sure, there's always going to be factors that make it difficult, even in this season of life as being a mom and not being able to travel too much or be away from my kids, nor, nor do I want to quite as much. Um, but really, I think the struggles have always come from within and, um, whether that's insecurity you know, because I was so young when the shootings happened that I, I would always question, well, who am I? Who am I to, to stand up and to teach adults or to share my story with these people who have struggled far worse than I probably had? But yes, I would, I would just say that it has always been an internal struggle um, from insecurity to even that, that comparison. We've heard that um, quote, and I guess it's been, it's been a quote um, I don't really know who said, I think it was Roosevelt, but, but comparison is the thief of all joy. Mm-hmm. And that really is true because as a speaker, especially someone who started young and is still young in many respects, um, I look around at all of these just incredible speakers speakers who are women, who are pastors, who are, you know, just just incredible communicators. And I start to get in my head and I let the enemy cast doubt. You'll never be as good as, as them. You'll never communicate like that. You'll never be that powerful. You'll never be this or that. And, and if you're not careful, you start to listen to that voice, you know, and I've gotten, I've gotten completely sidelined before because of the enemy's voice of going, yep, I'm not good enough. I'm not enough. My story is not powerful enough. I'm not smart enough. I haven't gone to seminary, so I don't know how to teach God's word like, like this person or this person. But the fact is, is that I wasn't designed or created to be any of those other women to communicate the way that they do or to have the platform that they do. And that has been something that I've had to cling to, that Jesus has given me my own platform and my own voice. And regardless of what that looks like in the future, whether I'm speaking to massive crowds, or if I'm speaking to 10 people, it doesn't matter that all he's asking me is to be faithful with what he's given me and to be a good steward of that. And so it's just a constant battle of the mind to believe God's, God's truth over the lies of the enemy, to believe God's word over the, the doubt and the lies. Um, Because that's really where the power comes, is being somebody who's in the Word and somebody whose eyes are fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter himself. 
because he is the one that has given me anything and he can take it away just as easily. And I think also to kind of answer that question in a couple different parts, um, I remember a season when Columbine and this story had kind of become my identity. And, and that was not a good thing. I was the Columbine girl. And I would almost use my story to kind of make myself feel more important. If I was feeling obscure in a crowd or if I was feeling like um, – maybe unknown or unheard or unseen, if I would share this story, suddenly, oh, people would pay attention. And, and I remember every time I would get up and speak, people would just come up, oh, your story's amazing. You, you touched my heart. And it just became about me. I lost sight of why I was doing this. I lost sight of the fact that I was given this amazing privilege and even this story for his glory, not for myself, that it had nothing to do with me. And, and so that took, that was a really big um, kind of monumental shift. In fact, I um, really speaking was kind of taken away for a season. I didn't get a lot of phone calls. I wasn't getting a lot of inquiries simply because um, I really need to re I needed to refocus my heart and my mind and to put my attention back where it needed to be. And that was on Jesus and not myself. It's kind how he does that, even though in the moment you're like, what's happening? (laughs) Well, it did. It felt like a death. It felt like when that speaking was taken from me, that my identity was stripped. And that's Mm -hmm. when I realized that it was, it had become a problem that I am not Columbine. I am not my story. It's a part of me and will forever be a part of me. But I believe that I was allowed to go through that so that I could share it for his glory. And so um, it just, it took a lot of time where he had to capture my heart again and all of my affections for him. Yeah, absolutely. How long ago was that? Um, That was probably about um, five or six years ago now. And so it was just a quiet season where I really dug into some issues in my own heart and my own past. I went through um, some inner healing prayer and, and met with a mentor and just had women walk me through some really dark stuff in my, in my past and in my life and um, just find freedom in some areas, Mm -hmm. areas I didn't even realize I needed freedom. Right. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> that's kind of how the enemy uses it, right? Like you're enslaved, but you don't even know it. <laughs> Absolutely. He is so insidious and so deceptive in that way. I'm hitting pause on the interview for just a second so I can tell you a little bit about Patreon. I've just launched my page, and this is a great way for you to get more involved with the Devoted Dreamers podcast and express your confidence and support for helping women find the strength, courage, and camaraderie we all need to pursue our God-shaped dreams. And no matter what you personally decide about giving to my Patreon campaign, I will continue to interview amazing women who will encourage us all because this is my passion. I so love introducing you to women who are following their God-shaped dreams, mostly so that you might do the same. But if you've gotten incredible value from these interviews, I would love to invite you to consider becoming a patron of the Devoted Dreamers podcast. You can find my page at patreon.com slash devoted dreamers podcast. There you can read and listen to a video about why I'm doing all of this and hear all the benefits of getting more involved in the show. One of those things is a patron feed on the site where you can access early release content and additional perks as a thank you for choosing to get more involved as a loyal friend and follower of the podcast. This is special content just for you if you choose to be a patron. My goal here is to really build a community because I needed encouragement to follow my dream. And I know that you do too. So I hope you'll consider getting involved. Check it out over at patreon.com slash devoted dreamers podcast. Well, talk a little bit about um, just like any particular verse of scripture that's been um, like a deep support to you in this time or in pursuing this dream. 
Yeah, that's that's such a great question. I think even I alluded to um, when you asked me what some of my struggles have been, mm-hmm. and I and I mentioned fear. Fear has always um, just had had its grip in me, and that was even before the shootings at Columbine. But really, since Columbine, I've struggled with some really intense fear, and that's been one area that the enemy has just continued to just bring bondage and slavery into my life of just really a lot of fear. I mean, not just fear of death or fear, of, but fear in every area of my life. And I, that's what's so crazy is when, when I kind of let fear creep in, literally it's tentacles just kind of started taking a hold of so many different areas of my life. And um, one area in particularly, um, not only in speaking, you know, getting up and sharing and, and all of these areas of insecurity and stuff, but also just that physical fear. And one area of fear that is even hard when I'm traveling and I'm, I'm on the road and, you know, staying at different places, it was always really hard for me to stay alone. Even if I stayed in somebody else's house or a hotel was a little easier because it was kind of a space that I could control. And I obviously spoke for many years, but it was always something that I battled. And as now a mother of three young kids and, and with a husband, he travels not very often, um, but every once in a while. And usually when he did so, I would have to pack up the kids and go somewhere or I'd have to invite some somebody to come over and stay with us because the fear was so overwhelming. And so just a few months ago, um, my husband was getting ready to go on a trip. And I just feel like the the Lord has been breaking um, areas of fear and bringing freedom in a lot of different areas. And I just decided I am tired of this. I am tired of, of being just stuck in this area of fear, crippled by fear, really. And so I said, babe, I'm, you're going to go on your trip and I'm going to stay home and nobody's going to come. And I, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if I was going to be up with my Bible, like on my face and I was going to be battling the darkness, you know. Um, but what I did know is that I was going to open up to Psalm 91 and I was going to start Hitting Psalm 91 to memory. And so every night before I went to bed, I had Psalm 91 out and I was just, I was just not only committing it to memory, but I was preaching it to my mind and to my heart. And then I would drift off to sleep. And the first morning I woke up, I felt like I was experiencing so much victory and I had taken back so much ground that the enemy had had stolen from me and I was just worshiping and I was crying and I was throwing up my arms and I remember I was down in my living room singing praise songs to Jesus and my daughter came down and she was probably thinking what in the world has happened to mom she's lost it because I was crying and I had my hands up and I was dancing and I was so excited and I said baby mommy did it I did it no more fear I'm gonna stay alone and just being able to even teach my kids kids that the enemy doesn't win that God and his truth they never return void and that God is enough and that his spirit living within us is enough to conquer even the biggest fears or the biggest things that we face in our in our lives and so I think I was even able to be a, an example to my kids and and saw change just fall off in my own life and so I have a huge smile because I just I feel like it was such a breakthrough so, and you still have it memorized? I do. Well, for the most part, yeah. Right. It was a while ago. I'm, I'm not very good at like, I'm good at memorizing things for the moment. And then, I mean, I know a lot of scriptures, but I don't know that I can fully do the Psalm 91 for you. <laughs> well, I was just going to ask, like, is there a verse in that Psalm that is still kind of on the tip of your tongue or? Yes, actually. I mean, there's, there's so many throughout there that I love. Um, but I love, um, let's see, where it says that um, uh, he will cover you with his wings and or cover you with his feathers and under his wings, you will find refuge. His faithfulness shall be your shield and rampart. And the reason I love that is because it gives me such a 
a tangible picture, such a beautiful picture of like God's covering and of God's faithfulness Mm -hmm. and of his goodness. I mean, that is just one that I just, I've, I've always loved. And so to me, there was even, there was, there was something so powerful about that, even as I was here in my house alone, that I just saw that God was just here. I wasn't alone and that he was, he was fighting for me and that all I had to do was be still in him, like it says in, in Exodus 14, 14. Mm, that's awesome. What a victory. Absolutely. Isn't it? Thank you. Thank you yeah. for celebrating with oh me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's a huge big deal. Um, has your husband traveled since then? Like, are you? He hasn't. Like, but oh. I'm not even, I, that's right. the crazy thing is I used to kind of like, I would get panicked and anxious, but now I'm like, you should go on a trip. I got this. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. God's word. It's beautiful. I, it's so it cool. is. I mean, his word is, that is our shield. I mean, that is our, that's what we have to fight all of those arrows that the enemy wants to fire at us. And, you know, sometimes those arrows can injure us and they can, they can hurt us, but they won't destroy us, especially when we have his word and we're armed with it. Yeah. I was just looking at verse five. It says, you will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day. Mm -hmm. There it is. There's that arrow. There it is. I know that's what I'm saying. It's all so good. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's such a good one. (laughs) Well, and I'm glad you talked about that because I feel like, you know, whether someone has, you know, this kind of deep fear that you're talking about, you've experienced, or even, you know, we talk about a lot of, um, you know, we talk about our God-shaped dreams on this show. And a lot of people say, well, I'm just afraid of whatever, like what might happen or, you know, I might fail or it might not turn out the way I expect or whatever it is, whatever individual fears are. And I think we can apply this, like, whether it's you don't like being home alone at night or God's called you to something and you're terrified of what might happen to you in it, that it's the same God for both of those ends of the spectrum. So that's a, and that is so true is that, I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, even scripture itself says, if God is in her midst, she will not fall. And so it may not exactly look like what we think or what we expect, but if God is with us, he's got us. He is lifting us up. He will give us the courage to get on that stage and to speak. He will give us the courage to write, even if it's the most vulnerable parts of our hearts. He will give us, you know, the ability to travel to foreign countries that seem scary. He'll give us the ability to stay alone. He'll give us the ability to be parents, even if we didn't have a great example of it. You know, he'll give us Um, the opportunity to start a business, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many things that we do, we don't do as with fear, you know, with fear blocking us. And, and the Lord is just, I believe we just can stop praying, you know, puny prayers, but to start praying big and believing God for the big things on our hearts, because I believe that God put them there, you know, that those Mm -hmm. dreams are not there by accident, that those dreams a lot of times are not like things that we're conjuring up. You know, I said earlier, I never would have dreamed that I would be a speaker. And now I love it. I come alive. That's the one thing I love to do. And it seems so crazy because public speaking is, you know, people's most, most people's like number one or number two Mm -hmm. fear. And it's something I love, but I, I could never do it alone. I could not do it apart from him. I could not do it apart from his Holy Spirit within me. And that's just it. I'm not going to fail if he's in my midst and if I continue to, to, you know, do it in step with him. Mm. That's awesome. Well, maybe you just answered my next question, but. Oh, no, sorry. (laughs) No, it's fine. I was going to ask about advice you have for the dreamers out there who are trying to figure out how to take that next step toward their dream. So. I think, you know, I just praying puny prayers. Yes. I mean that and just, and just stop waiting. You know, I think so often we wait till, oh, well, once, 
once my kids are a little older, then I'll do it. Or once I get a little bit more financially stable, then I'll go for it. Or once I lose this weight, then I'll do it. Or once I, you know, I work through this thing or once I, it's like, we always have this, this thing that's holding us back. And so I think it's, despite those things or in spite of those things rather that we need to go for it because there will always be something that tells us not yet or wait and sometimes God does say wait um but I'm just saying if if you know if there's really if if God has put this dream on your heart go out there and do it go out there with him with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and go and do it. And God will start to, to shape that and to show you what that's going to look like. And like I said, it may look a little different, but man, how much more exhilarating to go and to do it with him than to never, to never experience that dream or to never see that dream fulfilled because of, because of fear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have no idea what he's going to do with it. And, exactly. and you'll miss it if you don't, if you don't just try. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. And I, I am living testimony of that. I think I've missed things along the way because of fear. And I'm saying no more, no more. <laughs> so awesome. Well, I know you said that you're not traveling as much because of, you know, wanting to focus on your role as a mom and a wife, but I'm curious, is there any place that you're, speaking in the next several months if people like I don't know had access to come find you (laughs) sure yeah um I actually am getting to do some speaking at my church which is Lifegate Church in Denver um I'm I'm I've been preaching a little there and I'm working on launching a fall bible study there as well so I'm really excited about that. I'm writing that and working on that throughout the summer in order to launch that. So I would love for any woman to come and be a part of that um, or, you know, man for that matter. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> we're not, we're not exclusive. And then I'm going to be in San Antonio in the next couple of weeks. I'll be speaking at um, a citywide um uh, award ceremony and then some schools in San Antonio and then I will actually be back in the Florida area the Parkland Florida area this summer speaking at a youth conference and then a few other things there as well and um, trying to think what else oh I will also be up in Kremlin Colorado this summer up in the mountains which is Summit County they're having a big um, Christian festival there this summer and so they've got Christian bands and different things going on and I'll be one of their speakers so I'm looking forward to that so there's a few things coming up and of course I I um, love any and every opportunity that I get I just try a little less to, to travel and be away from my family, you know, while they're, while they're little and why they have a lot of needs. And I know that this time is short for me to pour into my children, to disciple my children that they may know and love Jesus, because I truly believe that that is the biggest dream on my heart is that my kids would know and love Jesus and make him known. Mm. Absolutely. I love it. Well, um, if I can maybe offline get that list of where you're speaking and I'll put that in the show sure. notes. If people, yeah. um, I don't know, listeners are all over. So maybe somebody's nearby somewhere that you're going to be. So we'll get that in the show notes. Um, well, Crystal, it's been really fun. I didn't even say this earlier, but we um, were just fortunate enough to meet at a Christmas party. So that's how we connected actually through, um, oh, Alex, um, Kirkendall, Krista right? mm-hmm. and Krista. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Love those ladies so yes. much. I mean, isn't it so sweet when, when we as women can just celebrate each other and stand, stand mm-hmm. shoulder to shoulder with one another and cheer each other on in our dreams and all of our dreams. I mean, I think something so beautiful and so unique happens when we stop competing and we stop having this like, scarcity mentality, like, oh no, but I need the stage and I need to say this and I need to write and I need to, the fact is, is that there's an abundance mentality, a 
especially when it comes to God's word. We need any and everybody, all hands on deck, sharing God's word, um, especially in this day and age and in this culture. And when we do that for one another and we celebrate each other and we support one another, that's when really beautiful things happen among women. And it's so fun to see that. And that's what Alex and Krista are all about, you know, they're all about networking and, and doing those sorts of things. That's what your podcast is about, Merit. So I'm so, I feel so fortunate to have met you and I'm so thankful that we're neighbors. (laughs) I know it was so, such a, um, such a sweet surprise to, to connect with you and so many other women at that sweet little Christmas party. I'm totally blanking on the name of their podcast. Help me. Um, it's the open door sisterhood. Open door sisterhood. Uh-huh. Like, I know it's something yes. sisterhood. Yes. Yes. So yes. The open door. Sisterhood. So good at connecting people. Um, as proven by us talking today. So <laughs> that's right. What a fun day it's been. Thank yes. you. Thank you. And I just want to have you wrap us up with my last question of um, just could you share how this whole experience, um, and, and maybe it's over that 19 years, but um, how stepping out in faith and following uh, God's dream for your life, how that's changed you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Such a good question. Such a sweet question. Um, you know, honestly, I've been so unbelievably um, just changed and blessed And, um, you know, I, I walking through the events at Columbine, I I obviously wish we could, that it never happened, you know, that, that we could have the lives back that were lost. Um, But personally for me, what the Lord has done as a result of that, I am so incredibly grateful that I, Um, as I said, I would never walk back or go back into the life that I once lived because I'm so madly, deeply in love with Jesus. I so badly want to be a part of the way that he's moving and partner with him in this world for building his kingdom. And um, just more than anything, I mean, just the, the things that have happened in my own life, now that I get to become a mom and I get to pour in some of the truths and the experiences that I've learned over the last 19 years, and I can pour it into them and they can stand on my shoulders and go way further than I've ever been, um, that I can stand up in front of crowds of people and tell them the gospel and share the gospel of Jesus Christ that I've been given opportunities to write, I still have to pinch myself. I just can't even believe and imagine that the Lord has given me these opportunities. And and I just want every lady out there listening to know that when we fully surrender to the Lord, when we fully surrender to the Holy Spirit, He truly does things in and through us that will blow our minds. You know, if we stop trying to hold so tightly to the things or to the ways that we think it needs to be, and we say, I am yours. Here I am, God, send me. God will send you. Watch out if you pray that prayer, you know, because God will send you. And that's the exciting thing is that God will use you. He will use the skills and the gifts and the things that he has placed on your heart. Things you may not even know are on your heart until you start walking with him and trusting with him and throwing your your arms open and saying, take me, let's do this. You know, Um, I think that's really the thing that I've learned is that I want to empower others um, to know that, that there is always hope and their circumstances, and that God really does have a beautiful plan and a beautiful destiny for those of us who trust Him and who walk with Him. So I feel like that's kind of my last charge. (laughs) If you've ever needed to believe that God is with you in your suffering, this was the episode for you. What an honor and a blessing to get to talk with Crystal today and to hear how God used the devastation she witnessed in the Columbine shootings 19 years ago to build a dream within her for his purposes. I mean, she went from never wanting to be a public speaker to now sharing hope in the midst of suffering with people all over the world and teaching God's word and building into her own little ones the strength and resolve she felt like she lacked 
as a younger person. God is amazing, right? How he can do that with the things that we feel like are going to destroy our lives. I've got some more takeaways from this conversation. Here are just a few. Number one, that God uses our story to make an impact for his kingdom. Crystal talked about seeing healing in her own heart through her willingness to step out in faith and believe God and trust him. So beautiful. Do you believe that he could do that in you? That he could use whatever aspect of your story to heal your own heart, to reach others who've struggled in similar ways, and to draw people to himself. I absolutely believe he can do that through you. Okay, takeaway number two, that whole part of the conversation about insecurity, comparison, and fear, and how the enemy lies to us in an attempt to sideline us and keep us from making that kingdom impact. We've got to pay attention to how he's using that internal stuff that really digs at us um, and instead turn it over to God and draw near to him and trust that he's got it. Finally, takeaway number three, that part of the conversation where she talked about letting go of the dream, having anything to do with herself. So that whole piece of it became her identity. She talked about that and then. Um, that she had used her story to bolster herself, maybe in times when she felt insecure at events or whatever, um, instead of letting her dream be the thing that pointed people to God. Um, And that led to a season of her not being asked to speak. And gosh, it sounds like that was such a merciful way that God drew her back to himself and um, showed her to just kind of let go of the the dream being her identity. So I'm sure you have some of your own thoughts and we would love to hear what's rolling around in your head following this conversation. You can do that over in the Devoted Dreamers Facebook group where we're talking about these topics and more. Please join us in there. You can um, find us in the Devoted Dreamers Insiders group, answer a few quick questions, and then I will accept your request and you can share your thoughts about this week's show and join in the conversation already going on in there. You'll find us on Facebook. And in case you haven't heard, you helped me reach my goal of 50 reviews for the show in Apple Podcasts. I was hoping to do that by May 31st, and we're there. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts about the show to help other Devoted Dreamers find us and join in the conversation. Here's a recent review from Elizabeth Grace S. entitled, Pursuing a Life of God-Centered Purpose. Elizabeth says, I love that merit strikes a beautiful balance between surrender to the Lord and pursuit of purpose. If we're all pursuit and no surrender, we can end up chasing our own dreams and missing what God is doing. But if we're all surrender and no pursuit, we miss out on God's best because we're not willing to take steps of obedience in faith. If you're looking to live more fully, I highly recommend you listen to Devoted Dreamers. Elizabeth was a guest back in March on episode 84. Go give it a listen if you missed it. And thank you, Elizabeth, for taking the time to share how valuable the show has been for you and just that whole um, surrender and pursuit thing that, that you wrote about. I loved that. So thanks. And if you haven't left a review yet, it's not too late. Head on over to your app, click on ratings and reviews, and share your thoughts there. And whether you've been around since the beginning, or this is the very first episode you're hearing of the Devoted Dreamers podcast, this Friday, June 1st, is a special day. It's my two-year anniversary of the show. And if this little baby hasn't come yet, I'm hoping to gather some friends locally to celebrate. But for those of you not in the Boulder and Denver area, I would love to invite you to share a post on social media this weekend anything you want related to the show, a screenshot of the episode you're listening to right now, a selfie while you listen, wherever it is that you listen, or you could post something about your own dream. We would love to see your baby steps in action or just share anywhere online or in person, the episode that has had the most impact on your own God-shaped dream. Just use the hashtag devoted dreamers and tag me. I'm Merit J O on Instagram 
Um, you can hopefully find me anywhere else, but in whatever you share, I'd love to know that you're posting out there and just to have your support and encouragement for this special date. You will find the show notes for this episode at meritonsa.com slash podcast slash 93. There you can connect with Crystal, find her speaking schedule for the summer, as well as the time-stamped takeaways from this interview. So in case there's something you'd like to go back to, this is your little cheat sheet to help you find it. And one more quick reminder that season four is coming to a close with the final episode posting on June 6th. I will be on maternity leave for the rest of the summer and returning with season five in the fall. However, over the summer, keep checking your podcast app. I recently tested out something new with my friend and past guest, Cynthia Culver. So keep an eye out for three bonus episodes of on-air coaching with a listener that I hope you're going to get a ton out of. And depending on how many of these I can get through before baby comes, I've got a handful of mini episodes planned for release in the months of June, July, and August. These little mini-sodes, as I'm calling them, will be approximately 15 minutes each. They're topical with tips for pursuing your God-shaped dream. Thanks to Komaku, who provided the ad music for this episode. And that is it for today. Thank you for joining me in this conversation. And wherever you are with your God-shaped dreams, may you have the courage to take one step toward their realization today. I'll see you next week. Whoa.